It's been almost two decades since we started our journey to educate and help you take action so you may better manage your financial future. Our goal is to help you accomplish your life's purpose. This podcast reveals financial tips, strategies, and insights that will help you to set your financial goals and guide you along the way. This is Managing Your Financial Future, brought to you by the advisors at Lucia Capital Group. Moving along, another episode... Managing Your Financial Future, Johnny Dean, your podcast host here, along with Professor Rick Plum, certified financial planner, professional, and uh, uh, Professor Plum, uh, welcome, by the way. Thank you, sir. We are are almost halfway through our season seven. We're just cranking these things along. (laughs) I'm telling you, man, this is good stuff. And uh, a lot of the topics that we we talk about on this show come from real-life experiences. Uh, In fact, most of them do. In some form or another, the topics that we talk about are things that you've seen or different advisors have seen. People have brought to my attention. Yeah, we, 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 try to, uh, we, we try to talk about things that are important to uh, people who meet with advisors or people who would like to meet with advisors. And one of the things that we've been known for for many, many years uh, and uh, going back, gosh, two, three decades, probably more than that, has to do with the whole idea of buckets. Have you heard of buckets? Since 1993. 1993. That really started coming around about the same time that the Bill Bengen 4% rule sort of started. Yeah, but they weren't they weren't part of each other. At the well, time. they weren't, but I, 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 associate, I, I associate it around that time because a bucket strategy doesn't use quite frankly, doesn't use it, the, the 4% withdrawal rate in its purest form, but it does use it. Uh, well, it's a guideline. As a kind of a guide. It, and But we will exceed that guideline at times if we know in the future so that, that we can bring it down. We know in the future that maybe somebody's delaying taking their Social Security so their mm-hmm. income from the portfolio can go down in the future. Or maybe their mortgage gets paid off. Their expenses go down so they can take less money out of the portfolio. So we're looking you know, into the future. What is this current withdrawal rate going to do to the future withdrawal rate? Uh, when either all the incomes have turned mm-hmm. on or some expenses have come off, uh, and how is it going to play out going forward? But yes, we look at is it from a guideline standpoint that if all the incomes are on, all the expenses are there, and they're going to stay there, everything's constant for the rest of life. Uh, you know, depending upon the age. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're trying to retire at 45, I don't know if I would use a four percent rule. If you're 95. You can probably go a little higher than 4%. Right, which is why we don't call it a rule. We call it a guideline because it is entirely bendable, almost to the... And point, it's, almost to a pretzel. It's all, it's all about the individual, what they're trying to accomplish, their age, yeah. uh, their risk tolerance even. Some people, you're given, they're just very, very conservative. And from a very conservative standpoint, 4% may be at the higher end of the feeling because it depends on how much of a portfolio they want left over, potentially left over as a legacy. You know, because if you're taking four percent, but you're super, super conservative and you're staying in banks, you know, you're obviously not earning four percent. So your portfolio is going to dwindle down over time Mm -hmm. uh, unless interest rates come roaring back. And I don't know if I'm going to see that anytime in the next couple of weeks. Uh, So people that say, well, I want to make sure my kids get at least what I have today and I'm only going to use CDs. Well, (laughs) then your withdrawal rates (laughs) One, <laughs> well, it, and and that has to do with the earnings. Now, now this is why we get into a topic uh, uh, regarding buckets, uh-huh. because we talk about withdrawing money from something that's non volatile. I don't want to say safe because safety is relative and all that. But assets that are non volatile. You mentioned CDs. What you talked about was an extreme example where somebody is completely afraid of the markets. They don't want to touch principal, heaven forbid, of any. Any part of the portfolio, and they can they only want to live off the earnings, but they are unwilling to use anything that has anything other than bank FDIC type and coverage. Yeah, and those earnings are pretty small right now, uh, almost minuscule. <laughs> where, where are CDs right about now? Are they? Uh, it depends on you know obviously the time. Three year CDs. I looked at uh, Bankrate.com. I mean, I, I don't have any stock in it, so you can't. Uh, but I just look at them as kind of a a, a national guide. Yeah, and I think I saw a three year CD was. Just shy of one. Yeah, one percent. So if you're going to, unless you're only going to take one percent out, yeah, uh, just take the earnings out. Yeah, I mean, a fixed annuity for a three-year period of time, um, I think, is a little closer to two. 
but still, hoo-hoo, yeah. almost two. <laughs> you, you, you can't get excited about that. So this is why we do something called Buckets, and, and it has to do with time segmentation. I want to get into the, uh, and, and we have other podcasts where we explain Buckets and why we do what we do and that kind of but thing. But real quickly, from a bucket standpoint, you want to have a, a safer, if you want to go that route. Non-volatile. Non-volatile bucket that you can draw down principal and interest of out of Mm -hmm. and leave the rest of the portfolio that has volatility has potential for earning you know a better and has shown that it has been able to earn a better rate of return Mm -hmm. over off the side where you don't touch it you don't touch any dividends and interest that are earned in the non-bucket number one we call bucket number one our safer less volatile area where we're going to draw principal and interest and then we have multiple buckets out on the other side where everything gets reinvested for the future so that when we've depleted or come close to depleting bucket number one we replenish it at that time or when it's opportunistic when the markets are in a positive nature uh, because the only way to get a better rate of return than what you're getting in banks and things of that nature is to accept some risk but with risk comes the, the issue that i never want to be put in a position where i have to sell something when it's down to get the cash flow i need to spend and I don't want the market telling me what I can and cannot spend on a de- year-to-year basis. So if I want to take control of my financial life, I need to have my bucket number one set up. I need to have access to money. If I needed $10,000 this year, it's $10,000. It's not nine ninety. It's not 9000 It's not 8000 It's 10000 Okay, I'm going to give up the idea that it's going to be 11000 to make sure it's still ten. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's the point. But realistically, oh, Professor Plum, over the course of time, historically, these assets, these, these more volatile assets, have grown. But we see ups, we see downs. Oh, yeah, we it's see, not a straight line, for no, sure. No, it or, is not. Or even a nice curve to the upside. No. <laughs> it's it would, a jagged line. It is. But the trend over longer periods of time, and I mean what, 10 years, 15 years, or longer. Right. And historically which I cannot guarantee will happen in the future. Yeah, and that's just, that, that's been the pattern. Now, you could have six years where it's right. not so great, 10 years where it's not so great, as you well, said. Well, and it depends on which, you know, th- four years you're choosing. If you chose 2000 to 2004, you weren't positive. You had yeah. three down years in a row. 2000, 2001, and 2002 were all down years. You know, 2007 was flat. 2008 was down. 2009, we hit the bottom, but 2009 was actually a positive year just from January to December. But so those were two year, years. Yeah. And there was a four-year period of time where you weren't positive. So there have been other four-year periods of time where it was positive all four years. Well, <laughs> and that's where the average comes in. But, you, you, yeah, but that's where luck comes in. And it depends on going back to a, a recent uh, something we did on sequence of returns. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is the next three or four years, five years going to have for you if you're retiring now? Can you guarantee me that the next four or five years are going to be really good years? No. You, nobody can guarantee that. And nor can they yeah. guarantee that they're going to be horrible years. We don't know. So we have to prepare ourselves by creating this safer, less volatile, not earning a lot portfolio so that we can draw some money out of it, leaving the other side of our portfolio to go up, up and to, down to and go, go through up. the whims yeah. of the market. Yes. And so here's the, the the discussion is going to have to do with this so-called bucket one, this non-volatile, this money that's the drawdown the, bucket. <laughs> yeah. Which in some cases, Professor, uh, you're going to be drawing down pretty low principal and interest, obviously. Right. And how low you go depends on some other factors, what you yeah. have in bucket number so, two and other things of that nature. So how do we set up our bucket number one? I, well, I mean, bucket it, number one is not one necessarily one investment. It's not the entire bucket number one is invested identically. How many years are we talking about for bucket one? Typically, we're talking about a drawdown so if, of seven years. The ability to continue taking the income, the cash flow, I should say, that I need for the next seven years out of this one bucket. Buying me seven years for what we call bucket number two uh, and that then refilling. And so, so if I needed 50000 a year to pick a random number, right. 50000 a year, I would... Uh, from your time, portfolio. From my portfolio, I would take... Uh, 350000 That's seven years. Now, in a, in a basic... And you're talking about if you're taking 50000 a year, your portfolio is a million or more. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. we're talking, talking about, about a 4 or 5% off. distribution. You're putting 350 yes. in bucket number one. Maybe you have another 350 in bucket number two and another 300 or something in bucket number three, 350 in bucket number yes, three long-term I, growth. But bucket number one, and it's not necessarily one 
investment. This is where I think some people get maybe not tripped up, but where they get they they, they don't necessarily understand because someone might say, "Well, I need three hundred fifty. I need I need fifty thousand a year for the next seven years. So I'm going to out of my million dollar you know hypothetical plus. portfolio plus, I'm going to take three hundred fifty thousand and what I'm just going to put it in a in a CD. I'm going to put it in a money market. market. I'm going to go down to the local brick and mortar bank and earn point zero one percent. Doesn't no, you're not going to do that with all three fifty. Well, I mean, in you many could. cases, you could if you really wanted to be super super conservative. I would say don't use the brick and mortar for the majority of it. Uh, use an online that has an FDIC coverage. Okay, <laughs> but but this is just to explain. Uh, yeah, so somebody you, could set it all, but but you don't like to do that. Well, I, it's seven years. So if I if I can get one percent or. One point eight percent for three years. I can segment the money I don't need for the first three years into a guaranteed account in a CD or a guaranteed account in a fixed annuity and get a little bit better rate of return. So over that period of time, knowing that I've left three years worth of cash in the bank, and then the other four years, you know, the, the last four years, are earning one point seven five. I don't know the exact number today. Yeah, but, but let's. But let's now I'm earning on average. 1% over that seven-year period of time instead of 0.01% over that period of time. Well, that's it. What you're doing is you're, you're taking this bucket number one, this 350000 to to use this made-up number. Uh, you're bucketizing that in a sense. I am bucketizing. So if I'm starting with brand new cash, I, I want to keep the next year in cash, in a money market, in something that's liquid, available to me. Maybe it's the online account that I have transferred over my checking account each month. Uh, but I don't want to take any risk. And, and I can't take any I, I need to be liquid liquid meaning i can get to the money without a penalty tomorrow if i have to whenever and so the first year i'm going to keep in that area the second and third year depending upon the conservative nature of the individual i may go into a different kind of portfolio that has just just a hint of volatility but should get me more than the 0.5 percent even that the banks are offering uh maybe get me one or two percent and maybe mix it up between that three-year fixed annuity and the and the the man the portfolio that gives me a little bit better. But I'm trying to stay within the confines of what I need. I need something that's given the time horizon that I've built with cash and other things, relatively safe over the period of time. But trying to get as much as I can within reason, within the risk tolerance that I'm accepting. So yes, we are basically bucketizing. The bucket, we're, we're setting up our, and you could even, back in the day, we could even ladder, and I've done this as recently as maybe three or four years ago, you could ladder bonds that matured each year. So in your 50000 you have 50000 in cash, then you have a $50,000 bond that matures a year from now. In the time, maybe it only earned 1%. And then 50000 that matures every year after that. And each year, the longer you went out, you were getting up into the 2 2.5%, maybe even 3% range on some of these bonds so that your blended rate of return over the, the laddered bond portfolio that matured every year uh, was two, two and a half maybe? I mean, Something that was back like, in the day. I don't think you can get that today. Bond. Uh, what, when you say really, bonds, what type of bonds are we talking about? It uh, depends on the individual, but typically we are dealing with investment grade bonds. Uh, the, the accounts that I remember dealing with were all IRAs, so I w- didn't care about tax-free or non-tax-free. I was just looking for quality and return and liqu- when they were maturing. But I mean, bonds. I mean, bonds could lose value too, though. Right? But if I'm buying a bond today, and it matures in two years from now, and my what they call yield to maturity, what I paid for today, compared to the interest that I'm receiving and the principal that I receive when it matures, I'm not going to sell it before the maturity date. So you're dealing with you know investment grade. Hopefully, they won't have any issues. Maybe even insured, so that doesn't have an issue. But I know what I'm getting. And so I know what my – and it, the yield to maturity is different than the yield on the bond itself because the yield on the bond itself is just taking par value where a yield to maturity takes into account How if much? I had to pay a premium for it or if it was at a discount today. So there's some other issues involved. But So when I'm setting up bucket one, I, I need 50000 a year, as I said. I took 350000 out of my million-dollar portfolio, hypothetical, and I – have seven years worth of non-volatile income. You suggested perhaps the first year, maybe I need it totally liquid. That might be a money market. Of well, it's some hard kind. to get liquidity availability money money on a monthly basis. Yeah. Uh, and return at the same time. Well, that's why. <laughs> so I don't care. I'm going to earn virtually and, nothing. And but what's the difference on on ten thousand, twenty, even fifty thousand dollars between, you know, 
locking it up at one percent and over and taking money out of it every twelve every month, it, it, it's no. you just can't get enough return to that to, that's to make right. it worth the locking yeah, it away. Yeah, so there's a reason for that. But so I'll leave it alone. I don't care. I'm going to earn virtually nothing, but I've got my income. But for even the, like you said, virtually nothing. One. I'd still rather use that online bank that gets me 0. 0.5 instead of 0. 0.05. Sure. Okay. But but either way, it has to be liquid. So for the first year I'm doing that. Second year I'm retired, I've set aside in something that maybe it's a one-year CD. And maybe give it's, me something uh, a little bit yeah. better. And it also depends on how we're starting. Are you starting from scratch your entire portfolio today you're retiring is in cash that's one thing now people don't retire with 100 percent of their money in cash so they may already have something in place that they bought years ago that could be used for a bucket number one that's better than what mm -hmm. we're getting with current rates i know some people that have some old fixed annuities that they bought five ten years ago or even maybe a little bit further ago they almost forgot about them for a while and those older fixed annuities from good quality companies have 3% and 4% minimum guaranteed interest rates, and they're well past their surrender value, their dates. So there's no surrender charge. It's now, <clears throat> excuse me, a liquid account earning 3 and 4% depending upon when it was purchased. That's bucket number one. Well, in some cases, that could be something so it depends, that you could or, use. And now, the only problem with what I see with people that bring those into the office, you know, they're very protective of that three and four percent minimum guaranteed, and they don't want to spend it. <laughs> well, okay. they're like, no, that's the, that's gold. That's the psychological <laughs> factor right, right there. But if I'm if I'm in year one of retirement, mm -hmm. my fifty thousand that I don't need until year six of retirement. Yeah, I could put in a six year CD. I can put in something that has a little bit of risk. So it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. How much how much risk if any, you're willing to take. But typically on the five, six, seven year money, we're willing to take just a little bit of volatility to get a higher dividend rate, to get a higher uh, interest rate, and depend, mostly interest rates. You've said CDs and things like that, Matt, bonds. Do you ever go even more on the risk scale for years five, six, seven on more market One? More being like stock dividends and things like that? Not Usually not. Yeah, maybe that's what I'm talking about. Usually you don't not, usually although do anything like that. There are some portfolios that are managed by professionals that look purely at risk return, and their goal is to get a rate of return that is an ex even net of fees is in that 2-plus percent range. And every once in a while, we will see them you know, use something that has a potential dividend versus an interest rate for that longer term money because for some reason the all the, the, the numbers work out where – it looks like it adds the the amount of risk they're adding to the portfolio is not commensurate with the amount of return that they're adding to the potential they're adding to the yeah, portfolio. Yeah, which is why it's it's possible to overthink all this because I'm quibbling over maybe getting a half a percent more. Well, I remember years ago that these portfolios that we're talking about, I was everybody was worried about interest rates going up. I mean, uh, if you remember that, it was maybe when when the interest rates were first hitting their you know, one and a half percent area. We're thinking yeah. interest rates have got to go up. And I was looking at the portfolios, the, the strategic portfolios for bucket number one that we've seen, and they had a portion of it allocated to long-term bonds. And it was like, wait a minute, hmm. long-term bonds tend to be very volatile on the negative side if interest rates go up. And everybody, all the pundits, everybody was talking about interest rates going up. Well, the reality was in the way they value or the way they they score the way they look at how they look at the risk return relationship the they were not as worried about interest rates going up significantly and hurting these particular bonds in the portfolio as much as they were valuing the income that these bonds were bringing to the table you know, they were saying you know, basically they're saying interest rates would have to go up a whole bunch to make this not be a good investment for a portion of the portfolio uh, and they just didn't see interest rates going up that fast now, I don't know if they saw interest rates going down like they did, yeah. but they didn't see interest rates. And they were right. It just turned out that they were right. But so having that strategic mix between – and they're, they're always looking at because we talked to them about junk bonds versus you know, investment-grade bonds. And sometimes they'll say adding a little component of junk makes some sense or the premium for junk is, and, and the, the return that you're getting for junk bonds versus investment-grade is there's a big premium or there's a little. So it, sometimes it makes sense to add a little. Sometimes it doesn't make sense depending but is upon that the pricing. A, even for bucket one? Even for bucket number one, if hmm. it's in an area that's being 
heavily scrutinized. But you got to be careful here. This is this you, is something that you don't just set and forget. This is yeah. a portfolio that's being managed on a daily basis. Do we still talk about three buckets? I I've heard. Um, well, there's three core buckets. Yeah, I, I'm really saying, do people ever go with two buckets? Um, not with us. <laughs> <laughs> you still I, have heard, a bucket two. Yes, uh, and bucket number two is something to potentially get a better rate of return than bucket number one. Obviously, accepts a little bit more risk, but has a se- at least a seven year time horizon. And so mm-hmm. typically in bucket number two, there's different types of investments and things. But that's where you get the more balanced portfolio approach. And even with today's interest rates, balanced portfolios should do over a seven year period of time in that 4% range, give or take, mm-hmm. uh, but has some flexibility and volatility. Now, depending upon what you're using for bucket number two and how much volatility it may or may not have, you could also use a, a six year fixed annuity, a six-year CD uh, or something. So if you've got a guarantee of principal for the six years, you're probably not going to refill bucket number one until close to the end of the six, seven years when bucket number one's almost running dry because you're, you're working that guarantee. On the other side, if you're using a balanced portfolio for bucket number two that has some volatility with it but a better potential rate of return, mm-hmm. you're monitoring to make, so you can see, well, you know, last year maybe they did 10%. Well, that's a lot more than we expected. Maybe we start taking some of those excess profits, value averaging, sooner. And so we don't wait until the end of the seven years, necessarily, to refill bucket number one, because there's a little bit of risk in there. So we're looking to use... Volatility comes in two flavors, upside and downside. Mm -hmm. We don't like the downside volatility, but we... Not when you're taking... Not when you're retired and taking money out. But when it's on the upside... How do we use that upside potential? That we use it to value average when it's better than expected. Now, if it's, it's if it's six months into it, uh, and my bucket number one's only been spent down by six months, and I got six and a half years left, you know, it's going to have to be up. You know, bucket number two is going to have to be really high before yeah. I value average out of it. But the further I go on bucket, you know, de- depleting bucket number one the more I'm looking to make sure that I can refill it in a positive environment, an opportunistic environment from bucket number two. To buy you and maybe another year or two. So maybe it's four years in, and I refill in four years. What, you know, because the market was up, and my bucket number two did an average of 7% a year instead of 4% a year. Just and making that up. Yeah, I have no idea. Well, now I've just reset my time horizons again. So that you know, the longer you go with positive, 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 then we're likely going to have a negative at some point. You know, that's just kind of Mm -hmm. the way life works. So if I've had a bunch of positives in a row, let's take some of that profit. Doesn't mean that the negative's coming around the corner. Maybe another couple more positive years before the negative happens. But I I never want to be put in a position where I'm selling something, especially to create the cash flow that I need, when I'm in a down position from where I used to be. Which is really the core of buckets. Yes, it's, it's, very much so. If you need income over the next one, two, three, four, five years, six, seven years, you want to parcel that off. You, right. want, to, you want to put a wall between that and volatility. Now, the seven year is not locked in stone. So we talked about bucket number one lasting seven years. The more conservative individual may have a longer bucket number one. Mm. Uh, or the more aggressive individual may have a shorter bucket number one. I've seen five and five for bucket one and two. Uh, we start with our default at seven and eight. Why? Because we want that 15-year time horizon for the rest of the money. The rest of the money is invested in the growth area that has stocks that can Mm -hmm. go down on any given day uh, quite a bit from time to time. And so we want to build in that long-term time horizon. But not everybody believes that 15 years is necessary. Have you? Well, th- that comes back to my question of have you, have you seen two buckets where maybe somebody has a 10-year bucket one type of scenario and then bucket th- they jump to bucket three for years 10, you know, for 10 more years. Do you when, ever? When I have seen that, I've seen a 10-year bucket number one and another bucket number two in place. Okay. Then some bucket number three outside of it. They basically got 10 and 10 or 10 and 5 instead of 7 okay. and 8. Um, but I've also gone the other way. Not I, but in, Clients have gone the other way where they go 5 and 5. Five-year bucket number one, five-year bucket number two because they believe 10 years is sufficient for you know, to get an appropriate amount of growth out of their stock portfolio. People need help, I think, setting up their buckets. I mean, you can well, do so. it yourself, but, Professor, there are so many variables, it would seem to me. Well, it's also, not, we're talking about the first step. 
of buckets, calculating how much goes into the bucket. In our hypothetical million plus dollar portfolio, we had 350,000 in bucket number one. Okay, is that all going to be from your personal money? Or is it going to be all from your IRA? Or not your IRA, yeah, or your IRA 401k? Or maybe should you blend it a little bit? Maybe 50, 50, 60, 40 between. So my distribution, that $50,000 that's coming out, maybe 20 of it's coming from my personal account and only 30 of it's coming from the IRA. And at that level, not all of my Social Security or very little of my Social Security is taxable, but I'm still getting the amount of money I need to yeah. live. So how do we, you know, first step is calculating the, the allocation. Yeah. The second step is the, determining the, the location. location of now you somebody say well wait a minute taking it out of my 401k as part of bucket number one my, my, i mean the 401k seems volatile money to me you're going to parcel off that 401k well, and say and 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 make that portion non-volatile right, as well. and sometimes leaving it at the 401k because they have uh, a really good now lately they haven't been as good as they used to be but the, the, some stable value funds ha still have nice rates of return and no costs and no fees and so leaving you know if we were going to leave all leaving three hundred fifty thousand in bucket number one at the stable value fund at the 401k if they will let you take the distributions when and where you want them uh you that can work out really well i ran into one 401k though the people are just retired um and they wanted to they're not exactly sure how much they need in retirement yet you know so they they've yeah. been looking back at their expense but the retirement happened last month. This is a complete transition period for them. They don't know what they're going to be spending. I mean, they know what the basics are, but mm -hmm. you know, they look at the basics and they look at what they've been spending before retirement. They're yeah. like, well, there's a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> Which happens. And so they don't know how much traveling they're going to do, what things that mm -hmm. uh, they have a daughter. They don't know where she's going to end up you know, for her career. She's you know, yeah. tried a couple different places. Um, so they don't know what it's going to cost. The 401k they had said, they, they had planned on saying, well, just set me up for X amount of dollars per month, you know, six, seven thousand dollars a month. Uh, well, their 401k, if you set it up for a specific dollar amount on a monthly basis, you can't change it ever unless you completely withdraw the account. Wow. And so they're like, I go, well, then just take it. You think you need 10 between now and the end of the year. Take out 30 and because they will let you take periodic random numbers whenever right. you want yeah. to, although you have to have a, a notarized form every time you do it. And so it's kind of a pain. I said, well, take out what you think you're going to need for the next three months. You know, and then, and then if you run short, a, there's other places to get some money here and there. And after a year, you might be able to yeah, figure after it out. After six months, you know, it, just, just take out quarterly well, what you think you might need, then set it up on. This is why you need help doing this whole buckets thing. You know, it's one thing to say, well, I know how much I'm going to need over the next six, seven years. I'll carve off that mount. I'll figure it out. I'll figure out the rest. But as you just said, Professor, it's not just finding out how much you need to fill each bucket with. It's where does that money come from? Because you, you have personal money, pre Many presumably. You, you, you may have a 401K or a couple of 401Ks, an IRA here and there, taxable uh, upon how much withdrawal. is taxable? How much is not going to? How much yeah. is it going to affect your Social Security? You got all these different little landmines in the tax code. You got to work your way around. Yeah, and and that's why it, it helps to have somebody who's got the experience putting buckets together. Somebody who can uh, has at least seen what could happen. What knows what the consequences are of taking this amount of money out of your four hundred one k versus this amount of money out of your personal. And if you're up into getting, if, if you've got Social Security income. Uh, uh, taxation. As part of the mix, the taxation of that Social Security, it's important to know where that money is coming from, right? Oh, and, and how it's being generated, what, how much is going to be showing up on the tax return that will then affect the Social Security. Because I could be taking money out of my, you know, I have $350,000 in a bank account, and I'm taking 50000 a year out of it. And how much of that is going on the tax return? It's a personal bank account. Oh, about $5. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. You're not even earning very much maybe. interest. Maybe. So that has absolutely no impact on your social security which means you probably shouldn't be doing it all from bucket number one because we need to be able to use up and don't give away that zero tax bracket area of the standard deduction so we want to take money out of the ira tax-free if we can do it well we've talked about that too as a other podcasts the, the, there's your tax management portion this is why you need an advisor folks you need to talk to somebody like professor rick plum or any of the lucia capital group advisors who work directly underneath professor plum uh, give them a call at lucia capital group maybe you need a buckets review 
Maybe you've got a bucket uh, plan that you've had for a number of years, but circumstances may have changed. I mean, you've changed. They usually do. <laughs> yeah. So, Professor, you've made changes to people's bucket strategies even just a few years into it, right? Oh, sometimes six months into it, a year into it. Life happens. Things happen. You know, grandkids or kids come back in the house and they cost you more money. <laughs> um, you or, or on the other side, mortgages get paid off. Yeah, and they, or, you don't need Or you find that you just don't enjoy traveling as you thought you might. Yeah. It, and so your expenses are not as much. Somebody who's seen this stuff can say, look, I've seen this before. I understand how this works, and I think we can help you out. Uh, 800-644-1150. You can talk to any of the advisors at Lucia Capital Group, who, as I said, have uh, constant contact with Professor Plum. 800-644-1150. Another way to do it is to go online and contact us through Lucia Cap, L-U-C-I-A-C-A-P dot com. You need help with buckets. You need to know what buckets are, how they work, how much to put into each bucket, and where they should come from, not just the allocation, but the location, stuff that a lot of people don't talk about, but we do all the time. 800-644-1150. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast as well. Get these episodes downloaded directly to your listening device every single week. we got a new episode. We do 12 or 13 uh, per uh, season, so we got a whole bunch you can listen to and listen to all the uh, past ones of uh, Spotify. That's where you do it, Spotify, and you can subscribe and listen there. Professor Plum, thanks so much. We're going to have... Social Security discussion next week. Okay, I'll look it up and see how to spell it and yeah, see what see it's if about. You, see if you can figure it out. All right. <laughs> In the meantime, for Professor Rick Plum, certified financial planner, professional, I'm your podcast host, Johnny Dean. We'll talk to you again next week. The information provided should not be considered specific tax, legal, or investment advice and is not specific to any individual's personal circumstances. To the extent that this material concerns tax matters, it is not intended or written to be used and cannot be used by a taxpayer for the purpose of avoiding penalties that may be imposed by law. Each taxpayer should seek independent advice from a tax professional based on his or her individual circumstances. Different types of investments and or investment strategies involve varying levels of risk and there can be no assurance that any specific investment or investment strategy, including the investments purchased and or investment strategies devised by LCG, will either be suitable or profitable for a client's or prospective client's portfolio. Thus, investments may result in a loss of principal. Accordingly, no client or prospective client should assume that the presentation or any component thereof serves as the receipt of or a substitute for personalized advice from LCG or from any other investment professional. You should always seek counsel of the appropriate advisor prior to making any investment decision. All investments are subject to risk, including the loss of principal. This material was gathered from sources believed to be reliable. However, its accuracy cannot be guaranteed. Examples cited are hypothetical, are for illustrative purposes only, are not guaranteed, and subject to potential federal and state law amendments. There is no guarantee that you will achieve the results discussed or illustrated. A value averaging strategy does not guarantee a profit or protection from loss. The investor sets a target growth rate or amount on his or her asset base or portfolio each month and then adjusts the next month's contribution according to the relative gain or shortfall made on the original asset base. Since such an investment plan involves continual investment in securities, you must consider your willingness to continue purchasing during periods of high or low price levels. IRA withdrawals will be taxed at ordinary income rates. Withdrawals prior to age 59 and a half may also be subject to a 10% penalty tax. CDs are FDIC insured up to $250,000 per deposit per insured bank for each account ownership category. Insurance services offered through LPL Financial or its licensed affiliates. California Insurance License Number 0518721. Annuities are long-term investment products designed for retirement purposes. Guarantees are based on the claims-paying ability of the issuer subject to their terms and conditions. Early withdrawals may be subject to surrender penalties and, if taken prior to age 59 and a half, may be subject to an additional 10% federal tax. Annuities are not FDIC insured. Certain terms and conditions apply, so please read insurance company materials carefully. S&P 500 Index is an unmanaged index and includes a representative sample of large cap U.S. companies in leading industries. An investment may not be made directly in an index. Before investing, carefully consider a mutual fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. To obtain a prospectus or summary prospectus, which contains this and other information, call your financial advisor. Read the prospectus carefully before investing. Stable value funds can be viewed as an alternative to money market funds. However, there are important differences, and stable value products can be complicated. Unlike money market funds, stable value funds are typically not registered with the SEC. In addition, they are not guaranteed by the U.S. government. The structure of or investments within stable value value may vary, and it is important to consider these differences in selecting a stable value fund. It is important to keep in mind that investments in fixed income products are subject to liquidity or market risk, interest rate risk, bonds ordinarily decline in price when interest rates rise and rise in price when interest rates fall, financial or credit risk, inflation or purchasing power risk, and special tax liabilities. Interest may be subject to the alternative minimum tax. Treasury securities are backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, but are subject to inflation risk. The information provided is based on current laws, which are subject to change at any time. Lucia Capital Group is not affiliated with or endorsed by the 
Social Security Administration or any government agency. Social Security rules can be complex. For more information about Social Security benefits, visit the SSA website at ssa.gov or call 800-772-1213 to speak with an SSA representative. Rick Plum is a registered representative with and securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and member FINRA SIPC. The investment professionals are affiliated with LPL Financial and are conducting business using the name Lucia Capital Group, a separate entity from LPL Financial. Bill Bengen is not affiliated with Lucia Capital Group nor LPL Financial. 